Face ID. We are now watching you, Ryan. We noticed you stayed up late last night. <laughs> Face ID is here to protect you. They do have a bedtime app that tells me when I need to go to bed. Yeah, I started using that too. <laughs> it's awesome. Never question Face ID. <laughs> yeah, so the bedtime thing, I've been using that, but I don't know if it's accurate or not. It tells you how long you slept, but... That's not why I use it. Yeah, it's because it's less it, harsh than the alarm yeah, sound. Yeah, and... Well, you can change the alarm sounds, but it um, you don't have to set an alarm. I never right. have to turn the alarm on. The bedtime thing, yeah. Yeah, it just yeah but then the thing is you, you forget about it on the weekend, and then you have an alarm go off at 5 in the morning, because sometimes Bro, I wake up at 5. Can set, you can set individual days. Oh, there. really? Yeah. There you go. You um, can literally say, I think there's an option that says weekdays only. So what's new on site? Sorry, it was on Twitter. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Is that what are I'm we paying doing, you for? Are we doing something? <laughs> what's new on the site? Surprise, um, surprise. <laughs> so I've been working on a series about forms, subject near and dear to me. Um, yeah, I'm going through like creating a bunch of forms using contextual components. The next video is... Um, the big end? No, the next video is, is like, how do we, we have different displays of forms. We have like this vertical form, we have a horizontal form, and, you know, how do we create a good API so you can easily create these forms in your app, but you don't end up with like a bunch of if statements in your components. Like, if it's horizontal, do this layout. If it's vertical, do this. Because we've been there before. Yeah, it's not fun. And yeah. then someone adds a third state, a horizontal, vertical, diagonal form that is the problem the third state because now you have two states you can get away with sloppiness <laughs> but once you have three possible states you got if 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 it like compounds it gets yeah. worse yep um yeah so what's the high level solution there we're going to walk away with two components we're going to end up with two high level components and they're both going to internally use like our same form component but at the high level thing is going to be uh, two different components and that makes it really clear. And then we're, we're going to get and do some refactorings later on in the series, but we'll see if we can keep it with two high level components and then just sharing the bits that are shareable or, or implemented as a shared component under the hood of those two components. Basically the, the shareable parts have nothing to do with whether it's a horizontal or a vertical form. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. then, and so it's, it's kind of the stuff you would think of as like, the um yeah what the html form provides right like the, the yeah. actual the building blocks the state tracking validations and some, sometimes i think like where you draw the line isn't always crystal clear and so i think it's good to kind of move between the two like that line is, is going to shift a little i think right uh, but it, it'll be good to go through those exercises and seeing like okay here's the situation here's how i decide where this logic goes inside of which of these like three components right so yeah it's exciting nice yeah and if you could imagine like an add-on that was like a form that would be like the last form you'd ever use you'd actually still always write a horizontal form component in your app since that's so much concerned with the presentation logic yeah but it's the stuff like yielding out the errors and the state of the form basically it's like you want the state and it goes beyond just like the model state if you happen to be passing in models it's like did blur tried to submit, yep. you know, all that stuff. Yeah, it's like the the non-presentational bits of a form. Right. Because there's a ton, there's right. just a ton of that. Right. Do you have a good approach and pattern for like sharing all that stuff and yielding it out in the com in the contextual components? I remember I've tried that before and um, it's there's a couple ways you could potentially think about doing it. We had that one app where it was like you make like a hash in the top of the template and then yield that hash out. Yeah. that try just yielding like a component instance and sharing state that way. I don't, I, I think yielding a component instance is like yielding. This is yeah. probably wrong. Yeah. I, I think you want to do a hash that pre-wires a bunch of components. I do think you end up in a spot where, where you get stuck and you need to do something else. Yeah. So we wanted like a, um, 
we wanted a reference in another and this other app you're talking about yeah. we wanted to basically use things that were about to be yielded out yeah to build even higher level components right. so you can imagine yielding out an input but then also yielding out like address inputs right but you need that input that you're yielding out to build, to build up, the address to input. build up all the address inputs so interesting we would like to find an address input with let or with with yeah let and with same thing here yep and then build that out and then inside of that let block was a hash so it's basically the input partially applied component gets built as the first thing and then it can be reused and yielded out it gets a little uh wonky um, inception yeah why what was stateful about the what was partially applied to the input so these the that we have in this project is is uh, limiting the developers yeah. to to super high level APIs. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea was so anyone can come in and get started with it and didn't have to have a lot of Ember experience, mm -hmm. and also didn't want to expose a bunch of configuration because we we things were getting over configured, adding complexity, so we pre wire the model. So these inputs uh, these right. inputs take a string. And that string is the attribute. So you would have form dot input. That's right. First name, and that's it. And that input knew everything: styling, right. and and it knew that first name meant model dot first name. Yeah, it was cool. There were some really neat things here. We could do yeah. like subforms, so you could do like like first name or user dot address dot street name, mm. and it could figure this stuff out. Nice. It's super, super high level, but that's where we needed to use like the with block to build right. up this partially applied component that they would then be used multiple times throughout the yield invocation. Right. Cool. Yeah. So we'll get basically to a simplified version of that in the videos. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, nice. And yeah, the big takeaway there being, well, we were just talking about this cause I was working on the functional CSS videos and the next one that we're going to do there and just talking about yeah especially someone like me my brain automatically goes to think about abstractions that you can build i think there's a lot of people and there's a lot of people in the ember community who think like this who are just eager to jump to the next add-on that can be abstracted and like we've talked about this a lot how it's hard to get those right and um especially with the the ui components versus other parts of the app and where it makes sense to draw those boundaries. Um, you know, that's why, that's why that is one reason why we like tailwind because it, it gives you an intermediate, it, it is an abstraction over CSS, right? Because you can say, this is the only green that we're using in the whole app. But if you want, um, different style UI components that are like style green, then you don't have to jump to like something like an Ember component, which is more constrained. Um, yeah, it feels sometimes it feels like there's still some missing m intermediate level between something like working with HTML and CSS and jumping to an Ember component. Um, sometimes it can there's that valley, there's that there's that inner like middle ground where I have a messy template and it's a bunch of HTML and CSS and whether it's a form or whatever, you're seeing a lot of like implementation details. The business logic is hard to see. It's hard to like read. It's just basically become hard to read, but trying to, you feel like you're not ready to get to a component yet. And maybe you don't even have like duplication. Cause we always say you should wait until you're using something three or four or five times before extracting it. But maybe something's just messy and it's not clear how best to abstract the way parts of it. Is your fear with jumping to a component here that it's, it's too powerful. Like a component breaks it's a just, whole lot of API surface area. I think the fear is that it's like exactly what you were saying earlier, which is you said it really nicely. You said UI, good UI components should make it my life easier as a, as a developer. And if I have to build a new page and I'm working with like a UI component library for this app, then I should be able to use those things. But if I have to use this thing and then have to go open and understand it, then yeah, you're done. Yeah. Because that thing is made more general. And so it's more com It's going to be more complex. And for you to understand it and extend it in a way is going to be harder. So that's why there's always this bounce back and forth between like HTML and CSS being the lowest level stuff 
and everyone knows how to work with those, so just do it versus um, something higher level that's going to make you more productive. See, I feel like I feel like as you work on these things, the things that need to be abstracted out become painfully clear. Yeah. And that if you try to start at the beginning and say that this is like this is our form component, this yeah. is what gets magically handled by the component, and this is what the developer is responsible for, you tend to get those wrong. I mean, yeah. You always I, I bold statement, you always get those wrong. I also would be interested to talk to folks who are, have worked in different environments from us because, you know, we have certain experiences based on like the kinds of apps we've built. Um, we've built, we tend to build more smaller projects that are our own, like even if it, we're at a company, um, it's not as constrained as some places, whereas other places are like more rigid design guidelines or the UI component library is going to be more well-defined and more established. Yep. Um, and maybe in those situations, it's like, but yeah, definitely starting from the beginning, like it's the whole bootstrap thing, right? If you start from scr from scratch app and all you have to work with is bootstrap, you, it's only a matter of time before you have to basically undo those things and work with new things and, and use them in a way that they're not really intended to be used. Yeah. So instead you start low level and build those up, but um, it's still, it's still tricky to get it right. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> I can't tell you what the next app we build. I can't tell you what the form components will be. Right. I have an idea. Right. But I can't tell you where, what UI components will be there, what form components will be there, what we'll do as just HTML and Tailwind. Right. So yeah. I guess that is interesting. Like you could think, you could ask the question, what are the things that we're carrying from one project to the next? UI form is one of them. Yeah. The, the low level UI form, basically the container. UI form the thing the non presentation like the, the component that maps to an HTML form right. tag the component that maps to an input tag yeah and yields all this nice state UI link to basically but the, but the thing is what that form yields will change from project to project because some some projects will need a drop down other projects we won't but that's the presentational aspect of it but well if, yeah it'll yield the different presentational pieces yeah. but maybe but maybe there is a way to abstract it where you build all the presentational pieces, but the UI, maybe there's that state that is common, which is basically the properties, what you would imagine from an HTML form that would be serialized if you sent it to a server. Like that's at the lowest level, that's the core thing, right? The actual data in the form. And then there's additional state that's always useful as an to an Ember developer, things like did the, you try to submit it, did you blur it, was there a server error? Yep. You could imagine those existing in an add-on and then building all your presentational layer like components with that thing um i think you could yeah i I'm think th i'm skeptical <laughs> i think it will happen one day i think it's just like form four and rails right yeah i mean form four is there's not a lot there i mean it's awesome don't get me wrong it's it's awesome but yeah it's it's what it's creating an input tag and wiring it to the model yeah but there's more state on the client for a forum, right? Yes. Way Blur, more. Blur. Way more. Submit, did submit, yep. server error. So those things I think would be useful to have. Um, another one that I see in every project now is like UI link to, just because link to doesn't decompose quite enough for you to yep. do everything you want with it. So we have this UI link to, which is basically like link to, it's the same API as link to, it's a superset of link to. It takes a route and an array of models, a list of models, and then but this one yields out some state. The transition to action, uh, the href, yep. and um, the active state, which you can use to build basically any UI you need to. Um, we have a, you have a video about this, right? Ye yes, it's part of the Tailwind series. Cool. Yep, building the UI link to. But that's another example, and that's, a, that's funny, right? Because that's also a renderless component. So it's like, what are the things that are being shared from app to app. It's like the renderless components. Right, because the presentation is the last right. thing that we share. <laughs> right, right. So it's pretty interesting. UI hooks, you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, the data fetching component you're working on. <laughs> no? We're going to, it's imaginary work. We're going <laughs> in my head. <laughs> um, and then we also are working on some async testing stuff. That's been interesting. Um, the async testing course that we started on Embermap. So that's getting into some lower level stuff about, yeah, async testing and 
it's just interesting. You know, every time you teach something, you have to learn it enough to really understand it. <laughs> um, and it's like one of those areas. It's one of those areas where in Ember you are like, oh, I've just managed to get by so many years without touching this stuff. And it's great because I don't have to know it. And then it's like sometimes every so often someone has to get in there. So it's good to understand it. Um, and then you, you're like, oh, this is like how Ember approached this. And they have all this kind of Ember stuff, ways of dealing with this in tests. But then, you know, part of learning this and talking to folks, you know, in the community about the different decisions and the, AP, the testing APIs. And this is like a common problem with like any UI has to deal with this, namely testing things that take time and like how your mm -hmm. test apparatus knows whether something has taken too long and um, is broken or it's just taking a long time because it is actually expected to take a long time, like yeah. a network request or some asynchronous UI action. Um, so yeah, that's been fun too, learning all about the test waiters. And at some point in the series, we're gonna do things like um, test animations. And that's gonna be really cool. Yeah, so I'm excited about that because that's always been something that's, it's one of those things that's just on the margin too difficult based on your current knowledge. So when you're working on those, you're just like, yeah, the test passes, okay. But like imagine having a bar chart component where you can actually, you're working on the transition. I mean, what I usually do when I work on like something like a D3 transition is like you get the data working and maybe you write a test against it and then you just tweak the animations. But you're testing it, you're just testing it in the browser, right? You're just reloading and looking at it over and over again. Cool. Imagine you could actually write a test that says, you know, it took this long or, I mean, how would you test like a cancelable um, liquid fire animation um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff there, so that'll be pretty interesting to yeah. get into. I'm thinking like a lot of times when I test this stuff, I just test like the ends and not the middle. Right. So I click something, wait for some final state to show up. Right. But I have, yeah, it's going to be super awesome to test the intermediate right. animations. Like with the loading button, did we ever write a test for the intermediate states with the spinner? Yes. You'd wait for the spinner but, and then you'd assert and then you'd wait for the thing to finish yeah. and assert so that's pretty good yeah but that's like two that's like basically there's three states that button can exist and, and the, it's a lot it's like a lot of code yeah it's a lot of code in in test yeah it's only three states right. imagine there were like two more animations in or there or just you know in between and you're you want to yeah. test different things like and that i wouldn't test i would maybe right. maybe test the beginning the middle and the end or right. just the beginning and the end right Probably just beginning in the end. Right. I've thought about this before back in the day when I did more D3 stuff. And it's like really at the end of the day, a lot of times what you want is almost like I'm thinking like a visual. The animation stuff is hard. But if you're really wanting to test like a bar chart, I remember even if I wrote tests against my bar chart components, at the end of the day, you would just want to see it with a data set and pull it up in the app. So it's really like given this data set, here's what it actually looks like. And so yeah. I really want like a snapshot, like a visual snapshot. Um, yeah, like you'd, you'd build it in sketch and then like you'd compare that sketch file. To or even even in the HTML. test runner, like um, just visit and then I get to pause, like use pause test and then say, yeah, that looks, that's what I want. And so given this data, that's what the bar chart should look like. Um, so that mean like every time you're on a CI run happens, you get a, a page. And you have to be like, yeah, that's what I want. Yeah, I guess that's, well, I guess if there's no diff, if it's a component test, that's like how Percy would work, right? Yeah, yeah. I it think would just pass compare it the, last, pixels. the last run right. or whatever. Right. Be cool to experiment with that. Yeah. They add in animations and now you're not just diffing yeah. pixels, you're diffing Frames. a movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Travis might get upset about that. <laughs> So you went to, uh, you gave a talk at Ember Camp last week, two yeah. weeks ago. Yeah, two weeks, just two weeks ago. Yeah, about almost a week ago, a little more than a week ago. Yeah, um, it was my first opening keynote, so that was fun. Nice. Uh, it was a cool like setup. It was not as intimidating as Ember Conf because there's not like a thousand people there, but it was good. There's like 150 people there. We were in like this cool Chase Tower in Chicago, first time in Chicago. Pretty awesome. Did like a river tour. They had like a river architecture tour. And the architecture in Chicago is like really cool. All the buildings there. So yeah, it was a good time. Um, good, lots of good talks too. Um, Spencer from Movable Inc. was there and Tom gave a talk. And um, I mean, there's a bunch of people there. 
Kelly Seldon was there. Tobias was there. Um, Rob was there. So yeah, it was it was awesome. Nice. Good. Yeah, solid Ember crew. Um, Katie Gangler was there. Um, yeah, talk was about some of the product stuff that we've been talking about the last two episodes of the podcast. So that was fun because that kind of helped crystallize the messaging. Um, it was about yeah the product gap and how engineers can be better coders by learning about product. Did you get any feedback from like the folks come up to you and like, Oh, that was a missing piece. There were some people who were like, I'm definitely gonna show this to my team. And you know, some, someone was like, you know, the first two thirds of it, I was like, kind of like, Oh yeah, I get this stuff. I'm right there. And then the last third, like the last symptom of a product gap you talked about, I was like, Oh, for shame. And like, we've got to address (laughs) this or whatever. So that was, that was, that made me feel good. Like I'm actually, you know, hitting a sore spot, which is the point, right? To highlight these pain points um yeah i think it resonated most with the people doing like uh app development on product teams and um helping them because i think a lot of this stuff is what i realized is a lot of the stuff engineers understand at a visceral level because they deal with it every day maybe for years um but it's putting words to it you know it's putting words to it. I mean, just like we've learned speaking with folks like on consulting calls, a lot of times like, you know, something doesn't feel right. And it's like, how do you verbalize it in a way that can help us all talk about what the real thing going on? Sometimes it's just understanding the words for that kind of thing. So with this stuff, it's like, yeah, an engineer is like being told to like make something. It's like, okay, can you have it done for me by the end of tomorrow? And it's, you're like, what do I say? You're like, how do I deal with that? So that was a lot of the conversation. Um, how to speak about trade-offs and deadlines and prioritizations and yeah, getting people away from trying to code to solve these issues. And you know, it's a lot, it's a lot of what we do with teams too is just like, yeah. You said that it resonated a lot with people that did app development. What about like open source? Yeah. So I think the open source aspect of the message could have been, I could change it. If I, w- I think it's almost like they're two different talks, even though, there is a higher level thing that's common between the two. I think it's pretty hard to get it all across in half an hour. Um, I think, um, yeah. So the notion of a product gap in open source, again, I think it applies, but, um, it's different. Like there's just different constraints in open source and, um, people are motivated by different things in open source. Like it's not as clear like a business or a product that a business provides is like, has a value proposition and that's where all the work derives from the value you're creating for your users or it should. Right. Mm-hmm. And so you can unravel all of that and tie it back to like user value. And again, the same is true in open source. Like the reason ultimately people use open source is because they value it. But the reasons people work on open source can be, are varied. People can work on open source cause they just want to, they can Seems just that's... code because they want to an open source project. But that seems like the open source project won't be successful. But maybe doesn't. that's okay. Maybe someone just is wanting to work on open source and not write documentation because they like to just code on that. They just want to work on that. It's like scratching their own itch or it's just fun. Um, so there's this idea that... Is that sustainable though? Well, I mean, I think it can be sustainable. Let's just say that, again, this is the thing. Like, There's your motivations for working on open source... There's lots, and part of it is wanting it to be successful and, and having satisfy your users. Part of it is just scratching your own itch and just putting your work out there and sharing it. And so, me from the product perspective might say, "Hey, look, on the margin, the most the most valuable thing you can do for your open source project next is, let's say, write documentation or like invest in design for a website because you know people judge a book by its cover, and like you have all this great code there, but no one's going to get there because they're going to look take one look at your website or read me and just bail." So it's like on the margin, you could argue the most prop, like the most valuable thing to do is these other things. But then it's like, so you can say that from a descriptive perspective, you can describe, um, if you want to do the most valuable thing, then you should do this, but you can't say, therefore you should do this because their motivations would be different. Whereas if you were talking to a business and they're coming to you and saying, how can we increase our revenue this year? You can say, okay. If that's your goal, you should do this. So I think the fact that people's goals are different in open source make this problem a little trickier. But I I, I do also think that there's still a ton of lessons here. And I think, um, 
especially the way I talked about cutting scope and from the perspective of the product manager, the engineers in the room are thinking about their, their product owners at work and they're like, how can we get them to understand this stuff or like communicate up that they have to make these prioritization decisions. Whereas an open source, like you are the product owner. And so if I was just talking to open source folks, I wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't say, I would say, Hey, it's actually up to you to do this and for you to take a day. And I talked a little bit about this, like with Mirage, I said, like I stopped working on the code and I took time to triage issues and like product management taught me to do that. It taught me to take time to do that instead of working on the code. Um, it, it reminds me of like the, the implicit, like you might not be aware of this, but you are implicitly making, yes. these, de- making these decisions. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Um, and you know, like everyone, you know, especially in Ember, like everyone is solving a lot of problems. Like there's a lot of problems that we're all solving and it's tempting cause there's a lot of people in Ember who like want to solve a lot of the problems and, um, so they think in general, they think, and also Ember is like a wide tent and Ember itself is like just a massive problem space. Well, just think about the work that we've faced yeah. working on Ember maps, Ember apps. It's everything from server side rendering yeah. to like stateless components, right. reusable. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's so, massive. So I think if I were just going to give a version of the talk to open source folks, I would talk about I would give some like case, the case studies wouldn't be like teams that are missing deadlines and blowing their budgets. The case studies of the talk would be like you saw a solution to the problem and then you published it as an open source package, but you were thinking very generally about it. And as soon as you did, since you were, since your solution touched these four aspects of like UI development, now once the iceberg is revealed, and each one of these four things, you realize that the way other people have deal with this is going to, you're going to now solve like a hundred new use cases that you hadn't thought of instead, like take one thing and just focus on that. And that way you can end up with a better product because you're always going to find out new use cases and bugs that happen because of the way other people use your thing. And, um, you're going to get in this spot. It's easy to get in this spot as an open source maintainer where you are now solving like a hundred people's problems and you're doing them all like inadequately because you took on too big much, you, you bit off more than you could chew. And then it's like your, your projects get into a spot where they're, they're valuable because they're solving certain people's problems, but then on the margin, they're like really not complete and you don't feel good. I mean, everyone knows this feeling, especially again, like there's a lot of like, you know, open source addicts and Ember who people who work on a lot of stuff and they have all these projects and it's like, how can we get to this? idea of like scoping down and shipping something that's much smaller and making sure it's a complete product with no gaps right that so people aren't frustrated with it and people will be way less frustrated if you just tell them that that's not a part of the problem space this add-on or open source project solves than if you tell them it does x everything and then when they hit this one of 10 edge cases you just you don't have the bandwidth to actually address it how does this, how does this play into like an Ember? We talk a lot about convention over configuration, community solutions, like shared solutions, mm-hmm. um, kind of moving everyone forward together. Yeah. When you're talking about all this and you say scoping down, I'm, I'm imagining like much smaller projects. So maybe yeah. like instead of a giant framework, you're just shipping the view layer, right. something like that. Right. Instead of but, Ember data, you're just shipping. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe just maybe just like the client side cache and ORM, but yeah, not identity, the data like a, stuff. A, yeah, yeah, identity, identity map, map exactly. primitive. Yeah, and, exactly. But then, okay, so are these two things not compatible? Can you can you ship a small package, but still say, but still say that that you're building a convention over configuration community yeah. thing, or or does can you have small package and conventions? Does small package always imply like lots of wiring, lots of configuration? I think that's an awesome question. Um, uh, I so a few thoughts here. Like, so first, you know, we obviously uh, React has been very successful. Redux was very successful. Both of those things 
projects bit off smaller pieces of the whole puzzle, right? Um, and if you look at what happened with Redux, it was extremely pro- popular. It solved the problem, and and yet there's a lots of different ways of using Redux in an application as part of what makes it popular and, and strong is its flexibility. But at the same time, because of the ethos of the React community, you're not going to have someone like Dan Abramov come out and say this is the only way to use Redux. Like he's uh, deliberately not going to say that. Whereas, like you're saying, people in Emberland want our community leaders to say that because that's part of why we that's part of the values that Ember brings. And and even just using Redux as an example, I would say there's some folks that I think over indexed on Redux mm-hmm. and went too far with it. Mm-hmm. And you want it's like. You I wouldn't want, want to work on those apps. I would want like um, safety. I mean, you know when you bowl and they have the little bumpers and the gutters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would want, I'm all right with using Redux, but I want those bumpers. Right. And I know that these smaller React Redux don't have that. Right. That, that makes me a little nervous. Right. So um, I think, um, I do think there's a middle ground, right? Where you're not too prescriptive. Um Basically, you could imagine uh, the community leaders of Redux, the folks who are now maintaining it, the folks who have used it for years, talking about what has worked best with Redux and apps and pushing that forward as like a best practice. And like you don't see that again because of the ethos of the community. But I think you could you could see that you could imagine that. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. Like Redux has been used for a few years and we you can ask someone that's been working in it and say, well, like. What is it good for? What is it not right. good for? And I'm sure they could give you right. a 30 minute talk right there. Exactly. And I think the second point is I think that the problem. So yeah, this is this, this is a tricky thing. Convention over configuration versus small libraries. That can't be the right, that can't be the dichotomy because then if you're saying we believe in convention over configuration, which we do, you get stuck with like bad abstractions. So I think the answer is is convention over configuration that decomposes into small libraries so you don't get boxed in. Because I think what people, when they have a bad taste in their mouth from convention over configuration, it's actually not because of convention over configuration. It's because they were working with an abstraction that was off in some way and they had no escape hatch. And so they say, I don't want that anymore. Um, so like in Ray- Rails, Rails is like the classic convention over configuration framework. And, you know, active record is how you work with data. But if you need to, you can write SQL. Yeah, it, de- it decomposes. I mean, you can, it write, decomposes. you can write an SQL string. Right. So I think um, those were the pieces that, that were missing and are being filled in with Ember and could continue to be filled in. It's interesting with active record because it, de- it doesn't just decompose from ORM to SQL it's, string. There are a whole bunch of steps. So right. it's like you have the your domain model ORM, but then you have uh what is it? it's like RL or some word I can't R- pronounce. Yeah, RL, R-L. A-R-E-L. Yeah. So then that you can use to to have a, a OO like interface mm-hmm. to build up SQL queries. Mm-hmm. If you needed to hydrate a collection on like something. Yeah. And you could like teach it how to do it, but you, you, still... you could basically use objects to create a left join. So you can do stuff like that. And then if you don't want to use that or that's not working out for you, then you can drop down to I'm going to write a string in SQL right? and I'm going to get back, you know, an array of rows. Right. I think that's one of the reasons Next.js has become so incredibly popular is because it's convention over configuration on top of React and all these other tools that people know. So, um, so is that the idea? Is the idea, the idea is start small, prove it works, see, see success with it, and then start to take those patterns that people have been successful with and build up. I mean, that's certainly one approach. You could also start high, but have better defined boundaries and not try to do too much stuff. I think, you know, you know, I think at this point, like, yeah, just you and I talking about our open source experience, like even me thinking about Ember Still I Mirage, the parts, it's more clear which are the lower level parts and which are the high level parts. Um, and so, you can imagine biting off a smaller part of the problem for sure. Or like storefront, right? Instead of um, maybe all you need is some, really what it boils down to is like the state that's exposed from the queries. And so maybe you've come up with a way to, to, uh, um, to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like to expose that. Yeah. 
and then it requires more wiring on the consumer's part, but you don't get into a bad abstraction. So, um, yeah, I think, so I think that if I was going to try to talk to a room full of open source developers about making better open source products, the, those would be like the lessons learned that I would try to, I would try to crystallize that method message, but it would be like, yeah, I guess it is kind of start small and, um, but yeah, definitely, I don't think starting small means you have to eschew the conventions over configurations mantra. Like, you don't have to reject that. Because um, I don't buy that, for sure. It's, what is it, strong opinions loosely held or something? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's tough. This is really tough. Um, There's something really appealing to me with with starting small and seeing what's successful and then continuing down that road. It is interesting though to think like what Ember would have looked like if it had done that, and maybe you get stuck in a couple ways. Like, you know, um, Angular didn't want to go from Angular one to Angular two in a completely backwards, incompatible way. Um, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So would they have been the fact that Ember tried to take the whole problem area? And then when they learn things, do it, move, move the whole problem space forward in a way that everyone can come along. You don't have that responsibility if you're just working on lower level stuff because you're never committing to the higher level solution. So maybe that makes it frustrating. And maybe again, you can get left behind in like a big upgrade or something like that. Yeah, that's, yep. So I feel like there's trade offs here, but, um, yeah, absolutely. Also too, I've, as, as an end user of all this stuff, I'm attracted to the convention over configuration stuff. Right. So that's a huge selling point to me. Right. Um, but then again, like, you yeah, know, when it's wrong, when it's wrong and, and I and, feel the pain. And like, if you think about react has gotten popular because it works at its level. And then even something like, um, GraphQL has taken storm and you can basically go back and say, okay, active model serializers was trying to do this first, trying to standardize an API and they did it. They had, standards for attributes and relationships, all this stuff. And then JSON API was like the evolution of that. Um, but it tried to take on a lot of the problem, right? It was more prescriptive and then try to take on a lot of the, the problem. GraphQL is very low level and generic. And so um, people who use it now and want to use a REST like way to access their data with like normalized data are going to have more responsibility of implementing that part. The consumers of GraphQL using GraphQL as APIs you're going to have to do more work to wire those things up than you would if you were, say, using like a JSON API backend. But there are some things that JSON API still doesn't do, and so you get boxed in, and that's where some of the frustrations come from. So there's frustrations all around, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're either boxed into an abstraction that doesn't quite do what you want, or you have to do more work. But I think probably overall, you know, um, being able to dive down to... If you, can, if you can think of... I think the ideal is to try to take on the high-level solution but always have the escape always, hatch. Always, always, yeah. The nice decomposition. Um, so what do you think it was about Rails? Like Rails kind of feels like... Big. Well, yeah, it feels like convention over configuration. Uh, feels like really high level. Mm -hmm. Feels like there are a ton of escape hatches there. Um, is that because Rails wasn't the first web framework and that web apps had been being built for, you know... 10 years before rails came along that they were able to nail the balance. Yeah. It feels like Net rails has. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, nail the balance. Good question. I think, you know, we talked about this before with something like Ember at the beginning and, um, just the problem being way, way harder than anyone realized with something like Ember data, for example. Yep. Um, even the rendering stuff, um, not only way harder, but it's also changed. Yes. The way we build HTTP apps yes. hasn't changed. We're still in the... Cons I mean, I guess there's like web sockets and HTTP 1.1, but we're still largely in the constraints of request response cycle. Right. Where, I mean, UI apps are just... Right. They're, <laughs> they're different every year almost, yeah, you yeah. know? Um, so even, that, even if not different every year, they are different than when Ember first started. Right. For oh, sure. Definitely. JavaScript's different. I mean, yeah, there's yeah. so many things that are completely very, very different. So that would have a huge effect on how you would do it if you were to start today. So, um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I think at 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 at, at the very least, again, thinking of this kind of ideal talk that's kind of working in my mind, it's like consider this when you're working on when you're about to open source your next project. Like, because I didn't consider this stuff when I have done open source in the past. It's just like you're actually usually just thinking at the high level and thinking how pleasant can I make this for developers because they're going to love it <laughs> when this is so nice, right? One of my first open source projects, I um, I added like ten methods that all did the same thing. They were like different versions of this the of the word uh -huh. to do the same thing, and that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. I was like, I just want people to come in here and be able to to call a method and just whatever they would think would just work. Yeah. So I'm gonna have like <laughs> this this method name be alias to like ten different versions of it, and it's like that was this is probably like the worst. <laughs> most egregious way you can make this mistake of like i just want everyone this to be super pleasant right 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 <laughs> so and right so being able to say like being able to step back and say am i doing this because really this api i'm working on right now how general is it how low level is it is there a lower level thing that i can expose that might make a little bit more work for the consumer but makes my job way easier and it's not about prior prioritizing your needs as a maintainer or developer of the library versus the user because you want the user of your library to be successful and to ha have an awesome time with it it's understanding that that the cost it's understanding that the the danger the risk of getting the wrong abstraction is going to make it worse so so inst at least I can speak for myself when I think about making an add-on like let's say we wanted to make like a style components thing it would be like what's the most high level amazing API ever right when really what maybe you need is like has style something like that like a mix in that like that's you toggle that so so what I'm saying is like I would normally approach it starting from the end thinking about what's the ideal API and never making never thinking about the trade-offs of Okay, what does it look like if we go down one level in the API, make it one level lower, which puts a little bit more burden on the consumers, but makes it way more flexible and makes it so we don't aren't locked into abstractions. Um, I think that is an extremely important lesson. Um, that's a hard, hard one, hard fought. What's the term? what's the phrase? I'm tired today. It's a hard one lesson, a hard le learned lesson. Um, <laughs> that you get when you try something to take on too big of a problem and then you realize that you you shipped a bad abstraction and that um you know hey if i could have just done something lower level then it would have saved my users a lot of pain and me a lot of work as a maintainer and it would let you do more right because if you make a higher level api that's good for your users but you get it wrong then you're going to spend more time fixing all the edge cases and you're not going to get to work on it, making other stuff yeah, I mean, and also, too, if you make a lower level thing, other people can start to experiment and build those higher level things on their own. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is, goes back to even Backbone days, right? Like, Jeremy finished Backbone, and he was like, basically, like, Backbone's done. And people were like, um, I'm having a really hard time building Backbone apps. Like, this is super messy. They're, again, they're thinking about Rails in their heads. Like, why don't we get some conventions over file system layouts and Backbone? He was like, no, Backbone's done. Um, so then they make Marionette right that has like an orm because like backbone never had relationships it just didn't it had models and collections so marionette had like relationships attached to it and so now you have again this is like this is the thing because now you have like a backbone marionette sub -commu community and but that's fine i mean that worked out well for a lot of them yep. and um to learn backbone you didn't have to learn marionette or the orm or anything like that so um I think it's okay to be able to say, and, and you know, Dan Abramov said the same thing. He's like, Redux is basically done. And of course, there's a million people asking for all this stuff, right? Like, there's so many people asking for things. And so to be able to say, no, it's basically done. It's just taking off a chunk of the problem space. And this is what, this is like the extent of our knowledge right now. And we're going to let people experiment to push it further. So. Seems hard. Seems really hard to. I think it's hard to know, but it's not hard to ask those questions. And what I see is people not asking those questions. I see people, I see people saying, "I'm working on this. Oh yeah, I have that thing. I'm, I I need to do that for that. Oh, I need to work on this for this thing. I've got four or five projects I'm working on, 
and there's no end in sight. That's that's the thing where I think you can say, what would it look like? We were talking about this earlier. What would it look like for Mirage to be done in some sense? Again, maybe you have like an adapter pattern and people can make Mirage middlewares to do filtering for JSON API stuff, right? You could imagine a lower level thing that it makes it more flexible and allows more experimentation in the community. And so that it's not all like I'm not the bottleneck or whoever's working in Mirage is not the bottleneck, right? Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to see you put together like, you know, four or five symptoms. Like you were just saying, mm-hmm. I've got this project over here. I've yep. got that pro. I'd love to see that. Yep. I, that stuff is always eye opening. Yep. Does it feel like you're going to be working on? Yeah. What's that joke about? Oh, you make one night, you make a bad decision, and 18 years later, you're still paying for it. What is that? A baby? No, an open source. You open sourced your, your favorite library or something like that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, maybe it's better to, t- to treat them as smaller experiments. Um, and, um, and to say that they're done and to understand that that doesn't mean they're going to solve everyone's problems. And there's going to be people asking you to do more work, but, um, but the best way to go forward is not to just try to string this thing along for years to cover every possible use case. It's like, you know, I think you got to be able to convince, I mean, you gotta be able to convince people, people like me that you can still make a small thing and you're not violating this convention over configuration yeah. mantra yeah. for member, which yeah. I think you've done a pretty yeah. good job yeah. here. But, but that's the, that's the yeah, key. Think, right. 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 I, yeah, I'm totally, I am diehard believer of convention over configuration for sure. Um, it's just maybe that maybe the rea- once the reality is that the, the problem space is too complex. And so we can be conventional about this layer down here and let more experimentation happen up here. And again, this is like what, the core team has talked about the key, like what Tom and you have talked about the keynote last few years, rationalizing the primitives of the framework. I mean, um, there, there's an RFC about element modifiers mm-hmm. and yeah, there's exactly. a lot of discussion about that. So then now there's another RFC about, uh, element modifier manager, <laughs> which is going to no, but it's, it's awesome because this is going to be that low level. I think they even say like, this isn't for, for app app authors. This right. is for like, add-on authors, add-on authors. To, to make add-ons to experiment with this. Yep. Uh, but that, this is, yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. I think it's great. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, tough problem is there for sure. But I think it's worth, I think it's easy for the pendulum to swing really hard one way. And that is making a closed, a walled garden equivalent of, a, of a, an add-on where the only APIs are these few you know, small public interface and, you know, but if you can ship the lower level thing, you might buy yourself. It's just like an admission. It's like, a, it's like, it takes humility, right? It's like an admission of ignorance that I don't actually know. It's a good thing we're working with a bunch of programmers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You have to admit that you don't know, you know, where, where that this thing is going to solve all your problems. I know it solves mine. So let's put out the lowest level thing that can still work for me and see where it goes. So. Yeah, it might be worth trying to swing that pendulum back a little bit. Cool. <laughs> Never been so excited for less features. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's hit up the mailbag. Uh, some mailbag questions. We uh, asked if folks had questions. Um, yeah, we got several people asking about TypeScript, so it's good that we've been using TypeScript in production for the last two and a half years. <laughs> we have not. You did some research on this, though. So. Yeah, I messaged some people. We talked to some folks in the in the Ember Map Slack about this, and um, so yeah. Uh, what do you think about using TypeScript in Ember apps? Chili Coder asks, um, and also iFlask Roman Trushev asks, state of TypeScript in Ember. Um, everyone we talked to said, basically TLDR: using TypeScript in Ember is a joy. Um, there's parts where you integrate with like libraries or add-ons in the, in the, in the community that don't have typings support. And so you lose some of the benefits you have to work around them. Like everything is an any basically an any type. Um, and then there's some awkward things. Um, you have to use decorators in order to use TypeScript effectively today in Ember, but that's fine. Um, and then there's some, there are some features that make it a little awkward Someone mentioned Ember concurrency. Um, the way Ember concurrency s- syntax works um, looks just a, a tad awkward with TypeScript. But it seems like the vast majority of their use um, 
was really nice and they said um yeah like they would just love to see it seems like a lot of add-on authors are continuing to to convert things over to typescript and ship typings to make it a more pleasant experience also there was some discussion about decorators since they are so important and fundamental to using typescript uh in ember um the decorator implementation of TypeScript today is different from ECMOS decorators. ECMOS decorators are actually still Sage 2, which seems far along, but they've been there for a long time and they've had some, um, there's been epic bike shedding going on over those. Um, so we were also asking like what's going on there, you know, um, is that a risk if someone wanted to start using TypeScript today? And everyone we spoke to reassured us that TypeScript is, um, committed to being a superset of JavaScript, of ECMAScript. And so once the decorators actually land in ECMAScript, the TypeScript team will be rewriting their implementation to match it. But they're not going to do that until it's stage three because they've already been basically burned by this. And so because there's still some flux there, that's why if you were using like ECMA decorators in Babel 7, it's going to look different than decorators doing TypeScript. But that's a known thing, and eventually they will be the same. Do you know as and there's going to be a code mod to, okay, to that's deal with what that. Ask. So it's not so, so they're saying they're saying yeah that, again the, the 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 TypeScript team is behind this and and the Ember folks are are there as well and so there's going to be code mods. So I think basically my summary is it's safe to totally safe to use TypeScript today. It's totally going to be um, a, a path in the future. Of course, it's still it's not as safe as using ECMAScript but it's safe and there's lots of people writing production apps and you're going to have good code mod support, which I think is like probably the most important thing because they basically said, who cares? The decorators change at this point. We're, we're going to be able to run a command once it's ready. So cool. Um, what's the best way to get started? Is it to, to convert like one or two components in your app? Is it to, to convert an add on? I think we should try and get back because I don't really know right now, but I do know you can opt into it. Um, piece by piece progressively yeah exactly because again it's a superset so any javascript file is a typescript file um you just change it to dot ts and i think you might get some some helpful messages from the compiler but um you can absolutely leave your code base as javascript and start one file at a time but we just don't have much first-hand experience with this yet so um that's why we reached out to some folks but i do want to try it soon and um especially i think in mirage it would be awesome because um I don't think I would need decorators there. I could just use vanilla um, TypeScript because I'm not working with Ember's object model, which I think is what part of the issue comes in, like using dot .extend and all that stuff, since Ember has its own object model, but most of Mirage classes are just ECMA classes. You have a lot of functions and a lot of arguments to functions, and so it might... Not only might it be easy for you to use, but also might help you. Oh, I think it would super. I think it would be super helpful. Chris was telling me like um, they have their own typings that they've written for Mirage, and like it just makes it so much better when you're doing like server create. You can if you pass like a hyphenated key instead of a camel case thing and as a string, it knows it. So, so Expl explain. So like you know how we have conventions over like camel case versus hyphens. Mm -hmm. And when you do server.create, let's say a Mirage, like you have to pass a hyphen string in. And there's areas like that all over Mirage that are paper cuts because you name your serializer plural instead of singular, or you use a hyphen or a dash instead of a camel case. But TypeScript can catch a ton of that stuff. So now as you're typing in your editor, you hit, it's like, I don't know how to server create a blog capital post. I need like blog dash post. Pretty cool. Really cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think the way you and I approach code that we will use TypeScript and, and we'll be it. like, why, why didn't we use this yeah. a year ago? Yeah, I agree. So. I agree. I think it's, I think it's time. Um, and it just is nice that it's one of those things that has taken up root in the entire JavaScript ecosystem. I mean, there was like Dart. Dart was like a big thing that never really took up root. Um, it was like their answer to like Google's answer to like, you know, JavaScript being a little messy. You had flow coffee script coffee script and then flow was a way to add annotations but typescript seems like really general purpose really well made um really solid support in editors so i think it's um obviously like a lot of glimmer is written in typescript more and more of embers internals are being written in typescript so um it's, it's it's a solid bet for sure i mean at this point no hesitation there so um i think mirage actually i think getting mirage 
getting Mirage to 1.0, the next step might be checking out TypeScript with Mirage. I'm also waiting, like I'm kind of waiting for just like some sort of green light to yeah. start using TypeScript. Yeah, so that might be good to, to ask and, and maybe we get a blog post out of the mm -hmm. team or something like that. Um, but I agree, like it should be on the homepage or it should be on the guides. Um, another question we had was, when are, this is from Matt Gardner, when are observers a fully public non-deprecated API actually appropriate to use despite the conventional wisdom that virtually forbids their usage? Any tips for making sure they won't bite me later on down the road? Yeah. What do you think? Um, so I have like three kind of thoughts here. Let me try to, to organize them. So the first is I think I think a lot of times in like the, the olden days where everyone started to swear off observers, we would get in trouble with observers because we would have observers that, that listen for data changes and then like admit other data changes. And now you have this whole system where data starts changing from observers. You're not sure what order it's firing in. You're not sure why things are changing. And it's like you have some component that's like buried deeply in the tree. And it has an observer that's like changing data that's affecting a component up here. And so you would get in a lot of trouble. So I think kind of like the first rule of like not getting in trouble with observers is like don't have observers that start like Don't setting, use them as a message bus. Yeah, don't or use them as a message emitter. Bus. Don't use them to like change data on objects that, that the observer doesn't own. So right. don't start changing model.first name, model.last, whatever. Right. model things that could be used at, uh, in other places in the system. Right. I think the second thing is um, a lot of the the component lifecycle hooks now I think can, can replace a lot of the need for observers. Mm -hmm. So now if, if your component gets new data and it needs to update something, you could have an observer that listened for that data and then updated something on the component, but also did receive adders can very nicely do that. So if you can solve your problem with, with a component lifecycle hook, I would do that. Like mm -hmm. I would, that's what kind of like the first thing, right? There are some areas in Ember today where you have to use observers, right? So like helpers that need to recompute need to have an observer. So like, say you have a helper that like it takes a user and then anytime that user's first name changes, the helper needs to, to, uh, recalculate its value you you would use an observer on the helper so mm -hmm. your helper would take a user and then it would have like observes user dot first name mm -hmm. um and this is neat like we have a number of helpers that a few times a year i have to write a helper that does right. this and i think that's like you do need to use this there's no right. other way the helpers don't have a life cycle right those those life cycle hooks or at least if they do have a life cycle it's not as an app developer we don't know it. we're not aware of it right so um yeah, not using as a message yeah. bus, try to use lifecycle hooks, and then there, there are places like helpers where, where you have to use them. Yeah. I also want to see, if someone's reaching for them, I would want to see what their what the use case is and see if there's a different or better way to do it. But there has been some times where it's felt like Observer was the right API, but we don't use it because it's not, like you were saying, there's better ways to do it. Um, but you can imagine a version of Observer that's like more... Um, like pared down and not as dangerous because the API sometimes is nice. Like if you have to use did, did receive adders and like track an old versus a new thing and yeah. like just trigger something on a property change, sometimes that can be unpredictable. Sometimes did receive adders can fire a lot or you know what I'm saying? Yeah, really what you, you actually yeah. want that declarative API for like actually when this thing changes, it's just the problems that you can run into with right. it. I think that because the life cycle hooks, they have like a very set order mm -hmm. that they are less surprising, right. although they're not as nice. Right. They're not declarative right. in the sense they're imperative when this, there are add-ons out there. I use, I basically auto install this in all my apps. It's like uh, Ember diff. Diff adders. Diff adders. Yep. There's a few of them. Um, yeah, diff adders. Yep. Is, I don't remember which one we use, but yeah. this, it says, when I receive adders and those adders change, right. fire this code. Right. And it, it, it ends up looking exactly like observer, right. but then you, you get the guarantees of like the I order know, and the order when this thing is going to fire. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, maybe something like that could make it back in Ember one day. You, you could imagine. Yeah, abs absolutely. 
Last question. Tips on refactoring an app with async relations on the most important models with templates triggering requests and all that sweet stuff and without lots of tests, of course. Nice. Um, I would also want to ask some more questions here. What, are you refactoring? You mentioned async relationships. Does that mean you're refactoring away from async relationships? Does it just mean that refactoring business logic is hard because the template is partially responsible for loading data? So if you're refactoring away from async relationships, um, I mean, this is tough. There's a lot going on there for sure. Yeah, I've done this in an app and uh, there you can use a ref helper, the ref, I'm sorry, you can use the ref references API for member data Yep. and you can make a helper that accesses the references. So I call this the ref helper. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a helper. It takes a model and relationship and returns that reference. Mm -hmm. And this is super, super low level. Mm -hmm. You don't really want to open up your templates and see a lot of ref helpers, right. but they're a great way for an intermediate step. Yeah. For so you plugging. can make a component. Basically what you're saying is if you have something like each post dot comments in your template and you're on async relationships and now your template is making some data requests and you want to be more explicit there, you could of course hoist it all the way up to the route or something like that, or the component did insert element and like do some data fetching there. But as an intermediate step, since it's already in the component and rendering the component is what's triggering that data request, you could make a data loader component that accesses the ref um, using sync relationships. Before you even make data loading component, just a helper. So so each postdoc comments would become each ref post string comments. As a second argument. As a second argument to, to ref. Yep. And that thing would re return the, the post comments reference. And then you could you could access value from that. Maybe you could just return the value from that. But at that point, it wouldn't be triggering the network request. Correct. So you'd have to do that yourself Correct. somehow. Correct. If you wanted the rendering of the comp of the template to still do that, ah, ah, ah. then that would be you would want like a data loading component, or you could data, yeah. theoretically use a data loading component that, when rendered, calls reference dot load, mm -hmm. um, and then yields out the data. Yeah. And then so that you would get the identical um, rendering where it's an empty state when there's no data and then it renders the block once it has the data. Um, and then you could now move that out if you wanted to render that, like load that in the route or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple ways you could take that depending on, again, it, it, it really depends on why you're refactoring. Are you, are you trying to get rid of async relationships or is it just that they're making it difficult to refactor your business logic? Um, I mean, the other, the other thing here is I would say it's, it's going to be a pain in the ass, but take some time and write a test. Yeah, I was going to say tests are super, I was about to say yeah. exactly the same thing. Like tests are super important. Um, Plus, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a lot of upfront work, but then when you actually do the refactor, yeah, it's going to make the refactor go so much smoother. Yeah. And you're going to feel good about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, I think you have to have tests for something like this. If I was just coming into a brand new app, I would part of, and I was just doing this actually in, in some open source work I was doing, I needed to add a feature. And part of that was writing tests to cover the existing functionality because I've just, that's just what I do now. I just don't, you ha, like, I feel, I wouldn't feel confident enough to change something without tests in some capacity, most of the time, <laughs> unless I'm really familiar with something, but I just feel so much better submitting a p any change whether it's a our own projects or open source if it always has a test because then i know what i i'm i'm submitting a code change it's changing the behavior and i know what i changed is working right yeah so i think yeah i think here you have to write at least a test or two um depending on how big the change is but it's so important and i don't know if it's you're not having you don't have tests because you don't have a good testing culture at your company and you don't have time to write tests. You don't feel like you have time. There's, there's some good answers there, um, that are worth learning about how to, how to make time for that. Um, or you don't know how to write tests again, there's, that would be worth learning how to write tests. So, um, I think it's really important though. Yeah. I think even just like outside of the, to the, you, you should test testing's important. I think for this particular task, refactoring something that uses async relationship, like, writing the test is going to be fast. This is going to be the yeah, fastest yeah, yeah. way 
to do this refactor. Yeah. So, yep. so even if you can make all these arguments for why you don't want to write tests, this, this specific problem, slip. I think, like, I think it requires tests. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's just so much with async, so much that happens with async yes. relationships. Yes. So, and acceptance testing is easy in Ember. So, um, making sure that all those moving parts work and you get the data you need, the comments actually show up in the list. Super easy to do that. Yep. Uh, if you have an acceptance test, so. Cool. Nice. Is that it for mailbag? I think so. Yep. Liz, you want to wrap it? Yeah. Thanks for uh, listening. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> where can uh, where if folks need to ask us a question or want to ask us a question? Where can they find us? They can hit us up on Twitter at Ember underscore map or visit us on embermap.com. Um, not slash podcast yet, but soon. And uh, or come hit us up on the media channel and Discord. That's where we hang out now. So, yes. um, yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>